Good morning, everybody. Things not to do. I'll make a mental note. Don't pretend like you're going to walk up here and then not do it because the instruments have no idea whether you're coming or going. I'm sorry, you guys. I won't do that anymore. I'll make up my mind before I stand up. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thanks for finding a place to seat. Um, there are yellow communication cards in the back of that seat pew in front of you, so if you'd fill one out if you are a visitor today, we would be extremely grateful. And if you are a brand new first time visitor, I would welcome you to step out after the service and go to the Welcome Center, which is right out through these doors. We have a gift for you and we'd love for you to stop by and introduce yourself and pick it up. The Warm Lake camping season is getting closer. Could you tell? <laughs> Everybody has been asking me if I was doing camp announcements today. I don't know what their clue was. Anyway, um, first thing up is going to be work camp. So work camp is coming up the first weekend in June, very, very soon. And there are lots and lots of jobs at camp that need to be done. We desperately need your assistance. I got to tell you, work camp isn't all work. It is really fun. And I hope you will consider going up. Um, it's especially nice, I confess, if you have your own RV. However, it's fun no matter what, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, food will be provided from dinner on Friday through a brunch on Sunday. They will provide wonderful meals for you. I promise you will be well fed in exchange for your labor. So if you ever wanted to hold one of those signs that says we'll work for food, this is your opportunity to actually do it. Okay. So um, Jeff Scott is your contact on that. If you'd like to volunteer, please get a hold of Jeff. Does everybody know who he is? Raise your hand, Jeff. Yeah. Handsome white-haired fella up here in the purple shirt. Not purple, what is that? Burgundy. All right, the June newsletter is available out in the lobby, and if you had not heard, the newsletter is no longer being mailed out. The cost of postage was becoming exorbitant. They like doubled our postage rates. So instead, the newsletter will be available in the lobby and you can pick it up if you want a hard copy, or you can go to the Caldwell FBC website and you can read it there on the website. So be there for you. And I imagine they'll probably archive them on the website too if you ever need to look up an old one. Okay, Secret Sisters program is getting underway again for a new year. So please check the bulletin, uh, ladies, if you would like to join the Secret Sisters program, or you can talk to Nana Wagner. She's your contact for that. And I believe I saw signups for the Secret Sisters out on the registration desk, just out through the doors. Okay, coming up on June 13th, following Sunday school, there will be the annual junior camp fundraising lunch. So. I hope you will take the opportunity, if you go out Sunday after church and have lunch, this will be a perfect venue for you. And even if you don't go out to lunch, you probably go home and eat. So I welcome you to stay after Sunday school on the 13th. Um, this is an opportunity for your contributions to send the fourth through sixth graders to camp. They don't have the same opportunities to uh, work to earn their um, camp money, their uh, camp registration fees, like the older teens do. So I hope you will avail yourself of the opportunity to have a wonderful, delicious meal and help some fourth or sixth graders get to camp. Now, the adult Sunday school has got some exciting things coming. There is a four-week membership class getting started for anyone who is interested in becoming a member of Caldwell FBC. And Pastor Brett would be your contact person on that. He is not here today. However, I'm positive that, Lord willing, he will be here next Sunday as usual. And you can talk to him about signing up if you have any interest at all. Maybe you don't know enough about Caldwell FBC to know if you would like to become a member. Um, and if that's the case, I hope you would attend the class just to get that information. There's no obligation for you to join just because you go to the class, but then you'd have enough opportunity to, enough information to make a decision. So, uh, two of the other adult Sunday school classes are beginning new topics the second Sunday, I believe that's the 13th of June, and there will be new details about those classes available next week. Um, this week we're continuing with, uh, what was the name of the class? American Gospel. I thought it sounded fascinating, but I was involved in another class. So 
Um, that one will continue again for this week. Next week, there will be no Sunday school because, just a reminder, because of the Memorial Day picnic. So, um, offering boxes in the foyer, if you have gifts for the church, just out through the doors, and I think it's still to the left. When you're going this way, it's to the left. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, we've got more announcements in the bulletin, as always, and Pastor John has got some information about the Memorial Day celebration and potluck. Thank you, Warren, nice get up. I appreciate that. Um, if you're interested in the membership class or just exploring that, you can just grab one of your yellow communication cards in the pew there and just, just say that membership class and Pastor Brett will get back in touch with you. Um, and then for the Memorial Day picnic, that's next week. That is um, next Sunday. The services begin at 1030, not 930, okay? So the service tomorrow, next week is at 1030. It'll be outside and we go right into our first all church gathering picnic, uh, bring your own potluck, whatever. Uh, and so we're, we're looking forward to that. That will be a grand time for our church body to gather together uh, as a whole outside for a great morning of worship and food and a lot of fun. So in light of all the fun, there are some signups out here. If you want to help with bringing some food, a lot of that's signed up for, but we can always use a little bit more. There's signups to uh, help lead, help serve food, help lead some of the games. Uh, one of the things we're gonna have is a couple of different size bounce houses for different age kids. And with bounce houses for kids, you need bounce house bouncers, right? <laughs> so. We need some folks who will just sign up for about a 20, 30 minute slot. You don't have to do it yourself. You're not standing at the door letting people in or out, but you are kind of managing a little bit. So maybe two or three can go over there, sit, talk, visit, but make sure the kids are safe uh, and there's a place to sign up for that. And then also there'll be several different games. And one of those games is going to be the cornhole bean bag toss competition. So if you're in interested in that, if you've never played that, just sign up, it's a lot of fun. And again, you can put beanbag on here with your name or there is a place out there to sign up. But all of these events go smooth and everybody just enjoys them when everybody has a little part to play in it. Um, and so please take some time and go back there and sign up. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, it should be in the bulletin. Uh, if you want to bring uh, chairs, if you want to bring covers for yourself or umbrellas, all of those sorts of things, uh, it's that typical outside in the, in, the, in the yard out here. We won't have lots and lots of chairs set up because our chairs sink, and so you need to bring your own chairs that will work well for you, okay? And then, uh, Warna, please. My apologies, this is what happens when you're working on the fly instead of reading your notes. Um, I forgot to mention, family camp is only two months away. So please, if you haven't considered family camp, or you have but you just haven't moved on it, um, there should be uh, registration flyers on the registration desk out in the foyer, and I will try to spend some time out there and capture people as you walk by. Um, you should be able to register online at CaldwellFBC slash, is it camp, Shane? Okay, I think it's CaldwellFBC slash camp. What is it for registration, Shane? Oh, perfect, warmlakecamp.org then. Wonderful. Um, go there and register for family camp, or if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, we do have paper here, but please think about signing up. Um, I would love it if you have any interest in orchestrating activities while we're there, if it's horseshoes, if it's a cornhole toss, if it's stories for the kids, if it's um, anything at all, singing around the campfire, if there's something that you excel at or something you just really enjoy doing, I would love for you to take the opportunity to share that. And just a reminder, a couple of years ago we started a new tradition, and that is that we have a 
It's kind of like a talent show, but it's not a talent show. It's more like sharing your giftings, things you enjoy. So I hope that you would practice something, maybe a skit with your family, singing a song, reciting poetry, uh, doing a gymnastics routine. We don't care what it is. Just anything you want to share with us. We call it a talent share because nobody's judging anything. So <laughs> thank you very much. I hope you'll think about that and get registered for camp. Uh, I do appreciate your passion for family camp, Borna. Thank you. Um, and again, next week is our Memorial Day service, our Memorial Day picnic, all church. And if you're new today or new for the you know, first time in a long time, or if you've just started kind of connecting with Colo First Baptist, we especially want to encourage you to come next Sunday. You don't need to worry about bringing anything or signing up for anything for you. Just come and enjoy the fellowship and get to know uh, Caldwell First Baptist a little bit better. But it will be a great time. And if you have any questions about any of those things, contact the office, contact me. Uh, as you've noticed, Pastor Brett and Pastor Nate and their families are gone this morning. They've been down at uh, Zion and Bryce Canyon. I believe they're headed back today. It does leave a big space up here on both sides. <laughs> So uh, I've been praying for them all week because they've been camping. That's a bunch of people to feed and take care of and keep track of. So I trust that they've, everybody got back on the bus and they're all getting back together. So anyway, if you would, uh, stand with me and let's do our verse of the month. Psalm 118.6, the Lord is on my side I will not fear, what can man do to me? Psalm 118.6. And remain standing as we pray. Father, we come to you this morning, and Lord, we are so thankful for Pastor Brett and Pastor Nate and their families, and we do ask that you would uh, take care of them as they travel home. And Father, we do want to come this morning, and we want to calm our hearts before you. We want to recognize who you are in our lives, and stop and and again, be reminded for our purpose in coming today is to lift up our worship to you. So we trust and ask that you would receive our worship as we desire to glorify you in our songs, in our prayer, and certainly, Lord, as we listen to the Spirit speak to us through your word, we want to hear you speak into our lives that we can become more and more like Christ. Father, we thank you that we can give back a portion of what you've entrusted to us, and Lord, in that, we also wish to worship you. Father, today we want to recognize that there are people within our congregation who have needs. We want to lift them up to you, Father. Some of them are financial, some of them are emotional, some are just people wrestling with things. And there are some, Father, who are facing d difficult physical needs, even life-threatening needs. And Lord, we want to lift these folks up to you. We know that you love us. We know that you love this congregation here at Caldwell First Baptist. We know that you love these individuals because they have given their lives to you and they love you. So care for them, Father. And Lord, we are thankful that we are not desperate, but that we can lift them, their, these people up to you, knowing that you will care for them. Father, thank you that we can be here this morning, and we certainly ask your hand to be upon Freddie Harris as he brings the word to us. And Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts. Let us not get caught up in other things, but let us hear you speak to us this morning. And again, we ask that you would uh, receive our worship. It is our privilege to come to you, to submit ourselves to you, and to listen to your spirit speak. In all of these things, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. And Dick will come and lead us in song. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 503. This is a hymn of deliberate decision and affirmation of our thinking about the Lord Jesus. And we're calling ourselves to rest in him upon his invitation to come and rest. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. Hymn number 503. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what Thou art. I am finding out the greatness of Thy loving heart. Thou hast bid me gaze upon Thee, and Thy beauty fills my soul. made me whole. Jesus, 
Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Oh, how great thy loving kindness, vaster, broader than the sea. This affirmation, this hymn, is in response to the invitation of the Lord Jesus, our call to worship this morning from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. Let's read together. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. to the Lord, who can question any of his words, who has teach the one who knows all things, who can fashion all his wondrous needs, behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him, behold our 
Jesus felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man. Oh, have fathom, uncle at his grave, Jesus, Savior, risen now to reign. adore him. Behold our God seated on his throne. Come let us adore him. Behold our King. Nothing can compare. Come let us adore number 231 is the hymn Jesus shall reign where e'er the sun and we're going to add the refrain to our king be highest praise Jesus shall reign where the sun does his successive journeys run his kingdom spread from shore to shore till sun shall rise and set no more blessings abound where'er he reigns the prisoner leaps to lose his chains the weary find eternal rest and all the sons of earth last to our king be highest praise rising through eternal days just and faithful he shall reign jesus shall reign people and realms of every tongue dwell on his love song and infant voices shall proclaim their earthly blessings on his name to our king be highest praise rising through eternal days just and faithful he shall reign Jesus shall reign. Let every creature rise and bring blessing and honor to our King. Angels descend with songs again, and earth repeat the loud Amen. To Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, after Brett's absence this morning, we have the privilege of having Freddie Harris come and open the scriptures for us. Freddie is one of our elders here at First Baptist. He's also the general director of Praise International, a local mission agency which encourages and helps pastors, 
in the third world with uh, a minimum financial support and primarily prayer support with local uh, folks here in the states who provide that encouragement. Freddie, come and open the scriptures for us. God bless you as you speak. Greetings, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to uh, Pastor Jet for allowing me to preach this morning. I've shared like missionary stories before, but I think I've been a member of this church for over 40 years, and I don't know if I've ever preached on Sunday morning before. So uh, this, is, this is a great privilege for me. I decided I wanted to speak on the subject of grace this morning, being a grace giver. I love the subject, and I think that's something that we all need. Uh, so let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. Let's read this. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and, and slander be put away from you along with malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. This is not a missionary presentation, but I am going to start with a little missionary story. Uh, about a day in Ivory Coast where I really needed a lot of grace. I, we were taking a team from this church, actually, uh, Buntley Wilcox, Ron Webster, and Ginger Dowen and Candy to uh, build a, help build a clinic in, uh, in an area of, of uh, Ivory Coast. It was the very first day, and you know how, as a leader of a team, you want things to go perfectly so that your team will be happy and that is not what happened on this very first day. We were driving from Abidjan across the country. It's a trip that it would only take eight hours normally. It took two days. Well, I'll explain the first day a little bit. Uh, we got a very late start because the van wasn't quite ready to go. So we didn't get started until almost noon. We got about an hour down the road and our brakes spring a lake. We had to stop for at least a half hour to fix the brakes. Then we got going. It was a very hot day in a, in a van with no air conditioner. The roads are bumpy and potholes, and we got slowed down a lot. And as it started getting dark, our, our van started making some really funny noises, some rattling noises, some shaking noises, and we were getting kind of afraid. Finally, it just stopped totally. And we looked for what it was. We were out in the middle of nowhere, of course, and we couldn't figure out what it was. Finally, it looked like, looked like the drive shaft of the van had fallen out. The drive shaft. Has that ever happened to you? And I'm thinking as a leader, like, why did they get us such a cheap van? I mean, th this, is, this is an important missionary trip. Well, uh, there was an African uh, man not too far away. He said, oh, I think I can fix that. So he kind of tr tried to do a makeshift repair and put some kind of rubber in there to hold the drive shaft in place. We got about 500 yards further down the road, and it, it all fell out again. Well, thankfully, there was a little village there. By, that, by this time, it was, it was dark. It was pitch blackout. And there was a little village there, and our, leader, our, Afri our African leader said, well, let me see if we can just park the car here and then just, you know, uh, sleep in the van. And he went to the village chief and just thought he would ask permission so they wouldn't wonder why there's a van parked right outside his village. Well, the village chief said, yeah, we'll find some place for you to stay right in this village. Like, really? Yeah, sure. So he went around and asked some, some of the villagers, would you mind keeping some of these Americans in your homes? Sure, well, their homes are, you know, are one, one room. And uh, so he came back and told us that, and we, we went, and it was so dark that we couldn't even see each other's faces. And uh, so they said, you know, here is so-and-so, they're going to, you know, keep you tonight. And so we went there, we, there was two different families that were, one was taking Candy and Ginger, and the other was taking Ron and, and Buntley and I. And 
the first thing that the family said, we were talking in French, was, you know, our habit uh, in our family is to, before we go to bed, sing a hymn. This is in the middle of Africa. We fell upon a village, and this family says, we would like to sing a hymn before we go to bed. Thank you, Lord, for that grace. So we were there in the dark. We still couldn't see each other's faces. They sang, what a friend we have in Jesus, in French. <laughs> Praise God. You know, what grace. I needed that because I was feeling bad as a leader. Then they, then they took us to the room we were staying in. They had the, ev evacuated their bedroom so that we could sleep in their room. They slept outside. We came into, the, into their house. It was, it was totally dark. I, when I say house again, one room. One room. The, we couldn't see whether there were snakes in there, big smiter, spiders or insects. Uh, just a dark room. We laid on the floor. We had just uh, sheets, nothing under us. And so we're just laying there kind of silently, Ron, me, Ron, and uh, Buntley. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, a few minutes of silence, maybe five, ten minutes of silence, just kind of laying there on our backs on this hard floor. And then Buntley, and I don't know if he's here this morning, but he probably doesn't want me to say this, Buntley started singing a song. Buntley started singing a hymn. I mean, I was like amazed. Bunley, thank you. It was a beautiful hymn. It wasn't What a Friend You Have Jesus. It was another hymn. And I thought, Bunley, that gave grace to me that night. And that was the way we finished our, our first very, very terrible day in Ivory Coast. And uh, you know what? It got better even though we t it took the whole next day to get back, get to the place where we were going. We all need grace. We need grace. And, uh, and God has given us a lot of grace, and God wants us to, to uh, communicate that to others. I'm sure there's a lot of people here today that just feel like they need grace today. This has been a hard year, hasn't it? Uh, and, uh, and things that have happened that have been really uh, hurtful, things that might have uh, really... Uh, affected our life seriously. I know during this last year there have been more divorces than ever before. Uh, but there are people that, and, and not just because of COVID, but just life in general, there's a lot of hurts. People say rude things. Maybe on, maybe on Facebook or Twitter or, or the internet, uh, people say rude things to you. Uh, it be, has become pretty common. Uh, and there are people that are, that are, that have bad manners, people that that bug us, people that uh, uh, don't respect us, uh, people that uh, don't appreciate something we, we do, uh, people that call us names, people that criticize us, uh, people that turn their back on us, let us down, um, people that are impatient with us, people that don't listen to us or, try, or don't even try to understand. Um, uh, I don't know if any of these things you can relate to, but maybe you're thinking about something. Maybe, maybe your child didn't call you on, on Father's Day or Mother's Day. Uh, maybe somebody's being irresponsible, uh, doesn't want to work, doesn't have a job. Maybe that person is your son or daughter. Maybe that person is your spouse. Uh, maybe, maybe you said something that you regret and made a big mess, and you feel that you don't even deserve forgiveness, but you need grace. What, whatever you can uh, think of in your life right now where you need grace, God is here to give you grace. God has given us, God has poured grace in our life. Ephesians, in the earlier part of Ephesians, it says that God has lavished us with grace. I mean, lavished us, that means poured on and flow, overflowing. God has lavished his grace upon us, and we need it. We need it every single day. Remember when Paul, in, in the Second Corinthians, he, he came to Jesus, and he, he had this thorn in the flesh that was very hard for him to live with. And uh, I think we can all identify maybe a thorn in the flesh and he said, can you take this away from me, please? And what did, what did Jesus say? Did he take away that thorn in the flesh? 
He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And, you know, God's grace is sufficient for us. But one time when I was reading that, I kind of had this quick thought in my mind was, like, Paul, like Jesus was saying, hey, Paul, I'm not going to answer your prayer. All you're going to get is my grace. You just have to settle for it. Settle for my grace, uh, you know, take it or leave it, you know. And like, where, where did that come from? Uh, Jesus wasn't saying that, you know. I mean, Paul wasn't saying, oh, man, all I get is God's grace. What a ripoff. I think I got the raw end of the deal. No, that's not at all. God's grace is amazing. God's grace is wonderful. God's grace is the best thing that, that uh, Paul could have had that day. God's grace is exactly what he needed. God's grace was, God, was his answer to prayer. So much so that Paul said, I will very gladly brag about my weaknesses because when I admit that I am weak, God's going to show himself strong. In 1 Peter chapter 5, it's, you know, it's always interesting for me when I read Peter, think about what Peter says about grace. Because you know how, how Peter really blew it, right? I mean, he denied Jesus Christ three times. And he also stuck his foot in his mouth quite a bit, right? I think that Peter needed grace quite a bit, and he received grace quite a bit. So it's always kind of neat to, when you read First and Second Peter, to see what he said about grace. Um, in in First Peter five ten, he uh, he called. He said, "This is the verse I uh, af, um, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore you, confirm." strengthen and establish you that's a beautiful promise isn't it i like the name of god that he gave god the god of all grace isn't that a neat name of god the god of all grace why all grace well because he's an amazing god and uh it's not a little bit of grace it's not part of his grace it's all grace he's the god of all grace and peter experienced that grace and and jesus uh forgave him for what he did jesus restored him refreshed him and recommissioned him and he became a great preacher a great pastor of the evangelical church god's grace will strengthen us in in second corinthians chapter one verse three paul gives god a very nice name too the God of all comfort. The God of all comfort. Now, the word in Greek for comfort is also translated encouragement in the Bible. I, I like that one. God, he's a God of all encouragement. That's a good thing, isn't it? Because you know what, Paul, he needed a lot of encouragement, didn't he? He had a lot of situations in his life where he needed comfort and encouragement. So, Maybe that's why he said that God is a God of all encouragement, of all comfort. God comforts us and encourages us by his grace. James 1, verses 2 and 3 says that we should rejoice in the various trials that we have. But this is hard to rejoice in trials, right? How can we do that? We can grit our teeth and and rejoice in knowing that we'll somehow be perfected through these trials, but it's still hard. The fact is that what Jesus told Paul is still true. God's grace is really and truly enough. God's grace really and truly helps us. God's grace meets us where we're at. Again, first in, in Peter has a, a great thing to say about grace in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. He says that each of us has received a gift. And I believe he's referring to the gift of God's grace. In this passage, it, uh, gr his grace is called God's very grace. In other translations, it's God's uh, mul uh, 
manifold grace. Or in, in my, in my uh, translation, it's called God's multifaceted grace. And I, I like the word multifaceted. It's the, it's the word that comes from describing a, uh, a diamond that has a lot of different sides. And you know how diamonds are. They're so sparkly. Why? Because they, ref, they reflect, reflect and refract the light. When the light goes in, like a prism, when the light goes in one side, it's kind of reflected, reflected, whatever the scientific word is for it, and it comes out in beautiful colors, a rainbow of colors on the other side. And that's the way God's grace is. It's like a diamond and, uh, that is, is bright and with multicolors. And, and I like to correspond it with, with, James 1, uh, with the James 1 passage because it says that we have various trials. You know what? That's the exact same word. I don't know why, but I get kind of excited about uh, word studies sometimes. And that word that James uses for describing trials is the same word that Paul uses for describing grace. The manifold or multifaceted trials that, that we have, we have multifaceted grace. I see it kind of like, uh, like our trials are color-coded, okay? We have the trials that come and they, they send out a rainbow of colors. They're not fun, really, colors, but God has color-coded grace, and his grace shines out the color, and for every tr trial we have, there's a perfect color-coded grace to meet that trial. That's why it says varied kinds of grace, varied types of grace, because there's different kinds of grace that meets different kinds of needs that we have. God's grace meets us where, where we were at. God's grace helps us in whatever difficulty we have to face. God's grace gives us a way out. God's grace strengthens us, comforts us, and encourages us and heals us when we have needs. Paul continues, or Peter continues to describe uh, God's man, uh, multifaceted grace in verse 11. And he says it en enables us to do two things. And I believe that, that what Peter is doing, I think, I think Peter is taking all the gifts that, that are talked about in the New Testament, the spiritual gifts, and I think he's dividing it into two general categories. Because it says that you each have received a gift, and then he talks about two things. Whoever speaks. How many of you know how to talk? Raise of hands. Most of you, okay. Uh, then it says that you will be able to speak the words of God. And it says, whoever serves. Now, how many of you can serve? I mean, work, act, okay, less. <laughs> um, we can all speak, and we can all act. And it says that when you serve, serve with the power, with the strength that God gives you. When you speak, speak in, with the words of God, and when you act, act in the power of God. This is what God's grace, God's multifaceted grace will do for us. And you notice the, the, the result of that is that, um, is that God will be uh, glorified in Jesus Christ, that God will be glorified. The more we allow God's grace to use us, the more Jesus Christ will be glorified in our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says, uh, Paul says that we are God's ambassadors. And he says that we speak in God's stead. It's like we are his, his uh, mouthpieces. That's an important job, isn't it? See, people see Jesus through us. People hear Jesus through us. People learn who Jesus is by seeing what we do. It's a heavy responsibility, but that's what being a Christian is all about. In James uh, chapter 4, verse 6, it says that uh, God gives more grace. 
God gives more grace. In one of the translations, it says that God gives a more excellent grace. God gives a more excellent grace. Wow. He gives grace, and he gives more grace. In John, uh, in John chapter 1, verse 17, it says that, that Jesus was full of grace and glory. He was, Jesus was full of grace and glory. And then it says, of his fullness, we have received And then it says, grace upon grace. Of his fullness we have received grace upon grace. Grace on top of grace on top of grace. A lot of grace. He's given it to us. And and it says, after that it says, and God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now again, this is is, uh, Peter talking. God get, well, it's James talking, but Peter says the exact same thing. He quotes it exactly, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Wow, what a contrast. And they are both quoting a verse in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, which says, uh, God mocks those who mock others, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. Well, then how do we get grace? How do we get more grace? How do we get more excellent grace? Be humble. That's the secret. I, I kind of see uh, that, um, that, you know, that God gives grace to the humble, kind of like a, a, a water faucet, okay? I see a, a water faucet, like a huge water faucet. This is kind of the way my mind works, okay? It's, it's really weird sometimes. So I see this huge water faucet right, ab- right above, and I think, you know, when I'm proud, God is going to say, ah, I'm going to resist you. But when I'm humble, God's going to open the faucet up wide and let, the, let his grace flood me. Isn't that grace? Great. God, if I'm humble, God's going to spray and pour his grace upon me, and that's the grace that I need. Does the next slide there that you, there, okay, see, there's, there's Brett, Pastor Brett, and he's, uh, he's in his sunglasses there, uh, enjoying uh, some vacation, but uh, God is p- pouring grace upon his life, too. By the way, I put myself there, I'm not saying that I'm the most humble people, person, because we can all put ourselves underneath the faucet of God grace, and if we're humble, and God can just turn that faucet on full blast, and that's what we need. Ephesians 4.29 says that our words, how we talk, should give grace to those who hear. There's a passage in Luke chapter 4, verse 22, that says as the people listened to Jesus, they, that they, were, uh, they were speaking well of him, and that they marveled at, his words of, at the words of grace that were coming out of his mouth. They marveled at the words of grace that were coming out of his mouth. The words of grace that were coming out of Jesus' mouth. Now, the neat, the neat thing is that God wants us to have words of grace coming out of our mouth. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Let your speech always be with grace. Let your speech always be with grace. And the same words there as words of grace are in that same verse. Otherwise, he's saying, May you always speak words of grace. Always. May you always speak words of grace. Now, that's not easy, is it? I mean, there are times when it's not easy to be gracious. There are times when it's not easy to say words of grace. But God wants us to be a channel of his grace to encourage others and to glorify him greatly. God can use our words of grace and encourage us to, to encourage and strengthen others to whom we speak. We need to speak grace into people's lives. Uh, we need to strive to edify one another. Uh, earlier in this Ephesian passage, it says speaking the truth with love. Now, speaking grace into people's lives doesn't mean that we're ignoring sin, but it means we say it with grace. Paul often used the term, 
in humility and in gentleness and in patience, he exhorted the people. He reached out to the people that needed to be encouraged, which I think is all of us. If someone needs to be restored, as in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul says, may he do it, restore him in all humility with a spirit of gentleness. The next verse, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that that, that verse follows, to speak uh, uh, in a way that gives grace. It's just a short phrase but, phrase, but I believe it has great significance. I believe that it carries weight. You know, the Holy Spirit is an important part of our relationship with God. The Holy Spirit is, is who brought us into the family of God, who made us part of the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit is what makes us intimate with God because it's the presence of the very presence of God in our lives. What a privilege to have God living in us and responsibility. When I was in France before I uh, before I got married, I went to to live work in France for uh, nine months, a uh, short term mission, and. Got to live in a castle, there's a story behind that. It's a, it was a Christian a mission that owned this castle. And around it, there was lots of trees, and the castle was on a hill, like often castles are. And there was, it was a really steep incline, and these trees were getting really, really, too, really tall, and it was getting very, uh, one tree was about ready to fall. It was very dangerous. And so uh, with some other missionaries, we were going to help that tree to fall down in a safe way. So we went on this hill, and again, it's very, very steep, and, and they, um, they, they took a, a rope, and they tied the, tr- the rope around the tree that was about ready to fall, and then they tied th- that, the other end of the rope on a tree above to hold it so that when it fell, it would fall sideways like that. And I was standing next to the tree above, really working hard, kind of had my hand against the tree. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And as they were kind of hammering on that tree below and, and knocking it to, to make it fall, I literally could feel the hacking of the tree below through the rope. I, I mean, I, I felt like this tree above was, was sensing the pain of the tree below. Bang, bang, bang. And this tree here was going, ow, ow, ow. And uh, the tree finally fell down. And I thought, you know, this is the way the Holy Spirit is with us. It's the Holy Spirit that, that ties us all together, that binds us together into one body so that we can feel each other's pains and encourage each other. And I, I think that this is maybe why the, the Spirit might grieve sometimes because the Spirit wants us to have, have a ministry with each other. The, spi- the Spirit wants to us to encourage each other. The, the Spirit gives us a nudge and then we don't budge. Uh, and that must make him sad. I mean, it would make him sad like anybody, like maybe a father who's, whose son or daughter is not responding or doing things that are very destructive and, uh, for his life. And, and uh, the father is just really sad about the choices that are being made. The Holy Spirit is in us. Today, I don't know if you know, uh, is, uh, is Pentecost Sunday. And it's uh, the day that we celebrate this sending of the Holy Spirit to the church. And from that time on, the Holy Spirit indwelt believers. And I just praise God for the Holy Spirit that ties us together. And I, I just want to be the kind of person, I, we should all want to be the kind of people that are able to listen to the Holy Spirit and be able to encourage and, sh- and give grace to the people when the Holy Spirit uh, tells us. The, the, uh, in another place, first, in 1 first Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, uh, Paul uses a, a similar word 
he says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, and this is in a passage where there's several things that Paul is asking, telling the uh, Thessalonians to do. He says, you know, do, do not repay evil for evil, but seek good for one another and for all people. Rejoice in the Lord always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And then quench not the Holy Spirit. Right there. <laughs> Why did he put it right there? And then it says, don't despise prophetic utterances. Hold close to you the things that are good and push away the things that are evil. You know, when it says don't repay evil for evil, that's, this is what our normal tendency is to do, to, to give back something that someone, someone is, ba- is bad to us and we want to be bad back to them. Uh, this is the, the human, natural, fleshy thing to do. But God, the Holy Spirit, wants us to not respond in that way. And the Holy Spirit wants to inspire us to be different, to live differently. The Holy Spirit wants to inspire us to, be, to rejoice always, to, re, to give a blessing for when we are cursed. Instead of uh, cursing back, God wants, uh, the Holy Spirit wants us to pray without ceasing for people. The Holy Spirit wants us to give thanks. And when somebody wants to give us an encouragement, the Holy Spirit wants, that, wants us to listen and, and have that tender heart. So instead of, we, but when we don't, it's like quenching the Holy Spirit. God, uh, we quench the Holy Spirit. We quench when we put a fire out. But God wants us to be, God wants us to be drenched with his Holy Spirit so that we can Listen to him and act according to, uh, to his nudgings, that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, controlled by the Holy Spirit, and walk in the Spirit. Uh, then, then the passage in verse 31 talks about grace. Uh, well, I call them grace stoppers uh, because he, he gives a list of, of things that we need to get rid of uh, that are that are stopping us from having grace in people's lives, giving grace in people's lives. You know, earlier Paul says that we can be angry but sin not. Now, we can be angry and not sin, but if we won't deal with that anger, then we can do a lot of damage to our own lives and to others. And so Paul right now says, if you want to be a grace giver, then we need to get rid of the grace stoppers. And he gives a list of uh, six things. And uh, it's interesting that these six things that he notes in this one verse, verse 31, in Colossians 3.8, he gives the same six things. Now, what is it about these six things? I don't know. <laughs> he, he gives this same list. It was important to him. I'm just going to look at him real quickly. Uh, bitterness, all bitterness. Now, you know, bitterness, you know, you, you know what that is when, you know, when you're distressed, when it's, you know, you're vexed, uh, all wrath. Now, the word wrath is kind of comes from breathing. It's, it, the Greek word is like breathing hard. I think of a, I, I think of a, 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 you know, a bull with, with the steam coming out of his nose. Uh, that's what the wrath is talking about. That's that kind of wrath. By the way, you notice it says all bitterness, all wrath, all anger. Now the word anger, it's, that's the word that comes from, from rage. That's what that means. It's, it's violence. It's, pow- it's a, a, a strong uh, uh, kind of anger. It's kind of like the, the bull in the... Uh, I, I got some slides there that I think are... Okay, there we go. <laughs> Uh, that it's, but it's the, the anger is the kind of uh, anger that is, is the bull in the china shop. It's the kind of you know, thing where we start to do some damage, serious damage. So, and then the next thing is called all, uh, all clamor. And what is all clamor? The, well, the, from, the, from the Greek, it, this is yelling. This is screaming. And uh, so this is where anger you know, really starts... Well, it, it hurts wherever, however it appears. 
Uh, you know that thing that, that I heard when I was a kid, and I don't know if they still say it, but sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. This is one of the biggest lies, right? Words hurt, and maybe they even hurt more than sticks and stones. Words hurt so bad. They go deep. And the kind of anger that is yelling and screaming is very harmful and, and sad. And uh, when we, we say things that we wish we could take back, instead of using those words that are divinely inspired, grace-giving, powerful, encouragement words. All slander. Now, all slander, you mean, you can call that, uh, I call it best fiends forever. Uh, but slander is when we talk bad about people behind their back. It's, uh, th- it says, it's, uh, the dictionary said it, vilifying somebody, gossiping, you know, saying something to somebody that you wouldn't want someone else to know. Now, all, all malice is, uh, is uh, basically being mean. It's mean-spirited. Saying things or doing things with an evil intent. And then uh, the thing that is added to, uh, to in the Colossians passage is this abusive speech, which really kind of includes all of them. These are all grace stoppers. These kind of things in our life, if not dealt with, will totally stop the grace from coming in and stop the grace from going out. We need to, Paul says, get rid of them. Cast them off. Do away with them. And we must take the initiative. Nobody else can do it for us. Uh, and maybe, maybe first we need to admit, look at it and say, yeah, I have some grace stoppers in my life. Maybe we need to ask forgiveness to someone for the damage that those grace stoppers have caused in their lives. But it's very important that we get rid of them. And Paul just says, get rid of them. You know, but I can't. Well, Paul says, do it. So evidently, we can. You know, I just think about Joseph, uh, you know, in the Genesis. He had some bad things happen to him. You know, after what his brothers did to him, after what Potiphar did to him, uh, in jail, the fellow prisoners that he helped didn't you know, return the favor. Uh, he could have been very angry and very bitter. But he must have dealt with it because God, uh, God, gave, him, uh, God gave him the ability to forgive his brothers and to be good to them, to be gracious to them. And he had a, God used him greatly. And he had an amazing redeeming effect on, on the people of God in that day and even to this day. Now, the last point here is that we need to, we need to put on a heart of grace. Uh, this, is, this is what's going to really help us, that, to be grace givers. Um, the, the, the verse, I just want to read it here, says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. In Colossians, it says that we need to put on a heart of compassion. We need to put on a heart of grace. Uh, being kind. You know, Paul says in chapter 2, he says that the surpassing riches of his grace. And, uh, and, and in Romans, Romans uh, chapter 2, it, uh, it says that the riches of his kindness, the riches of God's kindness, and he says, which was intended to lead you to repentance. God was kind to us in order to bring us to repentance. He was kind to us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. But Jesus was also a very kind man in his life. He, uh, we saw the power. You know, the word kindness, uh, it, it's, it's the idea of, of being useful, being helpful, Serving somebody, doing something beneficial for somebody. That's what kindness is about. Kindness is one of the descriptions of, 
of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We ought to be kind. And we ought to be tenderhearted. I think this is really important, tenderhearted. This is a, a beautiful word. Uh, Paul translates this uh, affectionate, you know. But actually, this is a stronger word than that word, affectionate. Uh, we need to, uh, it, the definition of, of tenderhearted is being easily moved to love, easily moved to pity, easily moved to sorrow. It means not being proud, but a, having a humble heart. It means not being hard-hearted, but having a soft heart. It means not being stubborn, stubborn, but and, and closed-minded. It means having an open mind, open to what the Spirit of God wants to tell us, open uh, to the encouragement that God wants to give that somebody else might want to give because someone, because the Holy Spirit has put that upon someone's heart. And forgiving one another, as Jesus Christ forgave you. Uh, um, you know, when I think about the way Jesus reached out to people in his in his time on the earth, it's 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 amazing the kind of grace that he had. In order to effectively love people, we need to first forgive them. It's hard to love somebody when we're angry at them, when they think that they're doing something stupid, uh, when they're in the midst of sin, uh, it's extremely hard to, to love somebody and to forgive them uh, when somebody disagrees with you, when they've offended you, uh, uh, when they've said uh, difficult things and saying we need to offer words of grace. I think about some of the examples, and you can probably think of some too, where, where Jesus was very gracious to people. Think, think about the, the, the Samaritan woman at the well. Well, you know, you know the way the story goes. Uh, she, was, uh, she was five times divorced and just living with the man that she was living with at the time. Jesus could have been very judgmental, but he wasn't a, a least bit judgmental. He encouraged her to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And she was so touched that she went back to her family and telling people about Jesus. The Messiah has come. And many people accepted Jesus. And then when the people came and met Jesus, they said, would you stay longer? And so Jesus stayed two more days. And it said that even more people accepted Jesus. And I believe it be, was because of his grace. Think about the story of uh, the adulterous woman that was caught in the act of adultery. And the, the people, the men, brought this woman to him to, to see if he was, to trap him, to see if he was going to have her stoned because that's what the law said that she should do, that, uh, that she should be stoned. And, and you remember it, he said, let the, the person who has no sin cast the first stone and then he bent down to write something on the ground which was kind of a interesting thing right I, I, I see it kind of like as a calm thing you know he just kind of you know they sat down and squatted down and started writing something on the ground I don't know what he wrote you know some people think that it might have been the Ten Commandments or, uh, or he listed the sins of uh, the people but one by one it says starting with the oldest in the group they left one by one, one by one. And Jesus, uh, Jesus at, at the end, he said, well, who's left to condemn you? And she says, nobody. And Jesus says, I don't condemn you either. I don't condemn you either. This is an adulteress. I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. And my son, well, I was talking to my son about this verse, and he says, you know what, Dad, I think that I think that when he said, go and sin no more, I think he was saying, you can do it. <laughs> By my grace, you can do it. You can go and sin no more. You can be freed from your sins. Jesus wouldn't ask her to go and sin no more if he didn't believe that she could be liberated from that. I think about the, also the sinful woman that came and washed Jesus' feet with the, in the house of the, pharma of the pharmacies. 
She, she might need a pharmacy, we all do. Uh, but this was the house of the Pharisees. And, uh, and so this sinful woman came in and uh, was washing his feet with her tears. And she opened a bo- bottle of expensive, uh, 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 expensive uh, perfume and anointed his head and, uh, and wiping his feet with her hair. And the, this, the Pharisee was saying, man, if he was a prophet, he would know what a kind of person this is. Ah, you know, he was judging her. Jesus was not. Jesus defended her. When Jesus saw her tears, he saw a woman that was repentant. He saw a woman that was sorry for her sins. He saw a woman that was grateful for, for, God, for Jesus' grace in her lives. And Jesus had an amazing impact on her life because of his speaking grace into her, her life. I want a, a verse that is right there. Uh, there uh, it's actually in Matthew chapter 12. It says that uh, he quoted uh, a verse that I think maybe was his, one of his life mottos. And he quoted Isaiah chapter 24, 42, and it says, a, bre- a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not quench. That was, I think that was his life model. I think it has a lot to do with his, his showing love and grace to others. Well, we need to be humble. We need to allow God to pour his grace upon us in full force. We need his grace. We need the, the healing of God's grace. Of, uh, the strengthening, the refreshment. We need um, to um, take the opportunities that we have to share grace with others. Uh, we need to be intentional. We need to not put it off. We need to not give the devil opportunity. Like Paul says, but we need to deal with that anger and allow grace to flow through our lives. Uh, receive that grace humbly and give out God's grace generously. Um, Hebrews in chapter 3 it talks about if you hear the Spirit's voice harden not your heart and we need to listen to the Holy Spirit and allow him to speak to us so that we can encourage those around us we need to get rid of our grace stoppers and whatever else is hindering us from being grace givers there will be no regrets if we do that uh, in the body of Christ, we want to be help each. Uh, we want to help each other grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We want to be channels of God's grace and allow His grace to flow through us, so that our words and our actions will communicate grace to those around us, and many, many people will be encouraged, and God will be greatly glorified. Thank you. Let's. Let, why don't we just close in prayer, God? Uh, we, we love you. We just feel so uh, honored that you want to give us your grace. You want to pour your grace upon us. Yes, we're undeserving, but that's what grace is all about. Lord, help us to receive your grace. Allow the cleansing that your grace wants to give us. Help us to, to seek forgiveness for those we have hurt and all those grace stoppers so that we will be able to be free to, to speak grace into people's lives, to pray great grace into people's lives. Lord, help us to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, yeah, I think that's appropriate. Yeah, what a... What a great message for, for today. What a great message for any day, right? Um, thank you, Father, so much for giving that message to Freddie. Freddie, thank you for being a will, willing participant in what it is that God wants to speak to each one of us, right? And then I, I think, like, as Freddie was talking, one of the things I was thinking was um, in my life now, how do, I, how do I practically take what I just heard today and put it in action? And so uh, two questions came to my mind. 
And, and, and so I want to I wanna, I wanna think about this today, and I would encourage all of us to think about these two questions today, pray about these two questions today, and discuss it with your loved ones today, these two questions. How has God shown me grace, and how can I then show grace to others? Uh, I think it's important that we, that, we, that we do that, that we take the grace that we've been given, we acknowledge the grace we've been given, and then we give that grace to other people. That's what we're called to do. Um, let's all stand. And I think also appropriately... Um, we're going we're gonna to jump into worship today, and we're going to talk about, in that first question that I just mentioned, how has God shown us grace? There, there's a place. There's a place where I think God's grace is more evident than any place else, and it's at the cross. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and Redeemer, greatest treasure, 
of my longing soul. My God, like you, there is no other. True delight is found in you alone. Your grace so well too deep to fathom. Your love exceeds the heavens' reach. Your truth, a fount of perfect wisdom, my highest good and my unending need. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer, strong defender of my weary heart my sword to fight the cruel deceiver and my shield against his hateful darts my song when enemies surround me my hope when tides of sorrow my joy when trials are abounding your faithfulness my refuge in the night oh lord my rock and my redeemer gracious savior of my ruined life my guilt and cross laid on your shoulders in my place you suffered bled and died you rose the grave and death are conquered you broke my bonds of sin and shame you rose you rose the grave and death are conquered you broke my bonds of sin and shame oh lord my rock and my redeemer may all my days bring glory to your name may all my days bring glory to your name jesus my our rock and our redeemer may all of our days bring glory to your name lord use us we are we are willing vessels father use us um, work through us to deliver grace to those who need it um, when we need grace father give us grace we pray but work through us to give grace to those who are in need, uh, to those who are hurt, to those who are broken, and, and most importantly, Father, to those who don't even know you, that they might come to know you through the love and the grace that we show them. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. 
As you go out this week, remember that. God's grace is enough. It's enough for each of us, and it's also enough to fill us to give grace to other people um, and to love other people the way that God has intended us to, to, to love. Um, we are, uh, don't forget Sunday school. Um, we, Sunday school classes are going on uh, right after church, so don't forget Sunday school. Hang out, learn some more, dig more into God's word. And also, I want to remind everybody, um, don't forget, like uh, Pastor JT had mentioned, if you are... Uh, willing and able to help for the um, uh, Memorial Day picnic, please sign up. There's uh, sign-up places here back in the lobby. So look for one of those places to sign up and sign up to help. So have a great Sunday. See you in Sunday school. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. God, I sing your grace is enough. Your grace is enough.